sense that we were looking at innovative models for uh, access to insurance coverage, and now we're going to be looking at an innovative model for actual delivery of healthcare. Um, and so we're very excited to have uh, Susan Ehrlich here, who is the interim CEO of the San Mateo Medical Center, and she's going to talk about the uh, uh, innovative care clinic that they uh, set up there. And uh, I'm, I've heard a lot about this, and I'm very excited that she's going to get a chance to share this information with you folks. Do, do we need to do the no. Again? No. You got it. All right. Okay, I think now I can say good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I've been interim CEO for San Mateo Medical Center for about six weeks. And during that six weeks, we submitted a budget to the county manager's office that uh, had $11 million less of county general fund money. We had a little issue with swine flu. We started implementing an electronic medical record. We implemented an electronic payroll system and so the fact that I'm standing here before you is actually, I think, qualifies as a miracle. So uh, I'm, also, uh, I'm also a primary care doctor. I'm one of the vanishing breeds of uh, primary care internal medicine doctors, and I still practice. So uh, all of this is very close to my heart. Um, I take care of, well, I'll talk to you a little bit more about San Mateo Medical Center and, and the patients we serve. So today, what I'd like to do is talk to you just briefly about why we need to innovate primary care, how we've approached innovation at the San Mateo Medical Center, and then talk to you a little bit about lessons that others might take away from our experience. I'm just curious um, about the audience. How many of you uh, are healthcare providers? So doctors, nurses, or work in some kind of healthcare setting? A couple of you, okay. Retired. <laughs> Retired, okay, great. And then, uh, Policy wonks, that you know, healthcare policy types. So, right, we're in Sacramento. Okay, all right, good. Well, that really that helps. So, this part of my talk is going to go fast, and this is actually could be any of these any of these individual slides could be the subject of uh, semester-long lectures. So, I'm just going to go through it really quickly. Um, th these are data from 2003, and it shows the health cost per resident by different industrialized countries. And so even though this is 2003, it's a $6,000 per person in the United States, nowadays that cost is about $8,000. And um, the other countries represented here, the, the UK, Sweden, Germany, and Canada, they've increased but not as quickly as we have. So that, uh, that divergence of cost has actually grown wider uh, between 2003 and 2009. So we spend a lot of money on healthcare in this country for a lot of reasons um, that I won't go into in detail. We can later if you'd like. And then this is one slide that is emblematic of what we get for that money we spend. And, and we don't get much. Uh, so this is life expectancy from birth, again in 2003. And the OECD is uh, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. There's actually 30 nations. They're mostly developed nations in the world. And um, the OECD measures all kinds of things comparatively. Economic, healthcare is one thing they measure. And this just shows you that, uh, so for uh, women, Japan rate, rates first. Uh, for men, Iceland rates first. Um, and we rank well behind them. So uh, out of 29 nations uh, in the OECD, there's actually 30, but for this ranking there were 29, we're near the bottom. So despite all of that money that we spend per person, on this one, life expectancy from birth, and you could look at all other kinds of measures as well, we also rank similarly, down near the bottom. So for all that money we spend, we don't get that much. And so this slide is really interesting as well. This comes from a, a, a uh, essay, basically, that was written in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago, and it looks at contributors to premature death. So I, I mentioned to you that I'm a doctor and I see patients and we talk a lot about lifestyle because I'm a primary care doctor, and people always say, well, my father lived to 100, so I don't have anything to worry about, you know. All, it turns out that all the folks I take care of are over the age of 65, uh, I work in a senior care center. 
Uh, and they all say, well, you know, I'm 70, but I'm going to live to 100 because my dad did. Well, it turns out that's probably not true. It depends on how you live those 70 years uh, leading up. So, because really, when you look at contributions to premature death, 40% of it has to do with your behavior during the life that you've lived. 30% is genetic. Uh, and then there are a variety of other factors that, uh, that contribute to premature death. Um, and I, I'm not sure how, uh, how many people understand this slide, but I think it's really interesting and important, particularly when we're talking about primary care. So when you drill down on the behavioral causes a little bit more, what are the things that contribute to premature uh, death? Smoking is number one. And obesity and inactivity are number two, is number two. And then there's a bunch of stuff that, that is way behind those two things. Um, and why would smoking, obesity, and inactivity lead to premature death? Well, it's, it may not be intuitive, but these things lead to coronary artery disease, they lead to strokes, they lead to pulmonary disease, they lead to things that ultimately <coughs> cause the death, but these are the activities that contribute to them. So that was, uh, that was, very brief, it was less than a couple of minutes, talking about the fact that in this country, we spend a lot on health care. We don't get very much for what we spend in terms of uh, looking at uh, indicators of health. Um, and when we look at why we, do, we die younger than we should, it's mainly 40% of that is due to our behavior. It's interesting when you think about that big chunk of money we spend per person because especially in light of what you were talking about, Micah, about all the money that we need to, to do healthcare reform. A, a lot of people contend that we have plenty of money in the system right now to take care of those 47 or 50 million people that are uninsured in this country. The reason that's hard to do is because it's easy to cover people. You know, actually it's not so easy, but in the discussion about healthcare reform, what I would say to you is covering people is actually the easiest part of it. How we get at this issue of spending lots of money for very little benefit, that's the hard part. And that's the thing that people don't talk about as much. They're, they're starting to, but that's much, much harder than actually covering people. So now we're going to go from the 30,000 foot level down to ground level, and we're going to talk about where I work, where I leave. Um, this is San Mateo Medical Center on a beautiful morning. Um, and this is what, San Mateo Medical Center is a public hospital and a, pub, a publicly, a, a vertically integrated system of care. So it says medical center, but medical center, we're really much bigger than that. So, uh, and the biggest, one of the biggest things we do is ambulatory care. We have 11 primary care clinics. I'll show you where they are in a minute. Um, we do primary care, we do medical uh, and surgical subspecialty care, pediatrics, and then we have uh, a senior care center, which is where I work. Uh, we do acute care, so we have a medical emergency room, we have medical and surgical inpatient wards, an intensive care unit, short stay, infusion center. We do psychiatric care, both inpatient and emergency. Uh, we have a, a very large uh, presence uh, in long-term care in the community. We have about 300 long-term care beds that we run, both in the main campus medical center and then in a separate uh, center off-site. Um, and then we have some special services like our Keller Center for Family Violence. So this is a picture of San Mateo County. Um, let's see, as you're looking at this, on the right, for those of you who aren't familiar with San Mateo, is the bay, and on the left is the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And San Mateo County is really very interesting geographically because that cluster, that strip, uh, where all the hospitals and clinics are, is quite um, sort of suburban urban. And then uh, you go over a big hill over to the coast, and all that area where there's no hospitals or clinics is quite rural. So it's a very interesting county geographically. Um, you can see our clinics are uh, the, the blue crosses. Um, so we have clinics in Daly City in South San Francisco, in San Mateo, and then down in Redwood City and Menlo Park. There are quite a few hospitals. We have two Kaiser hospitals at the very north end of the county and the south end of the county. We have Mills Peninsula Hospital, Sequoia Hospital, these are Sutter and Catholic Healthcare West institutions, and then our county hospital in the middle. So in terms of a, um, a, a system of healthcare, and I, I would say actually in San Mateo County we have somewhat of a system that we've worked very hard to develop, and that's the topic of another lecture, but we have a pretty good system. So I'm gonna tell the story of one clinic, 
Uh, this is our adult primary, or was, our adult primary care medical clinic. Um, looks pretty ordinary, right? It's on the third floor of our medical center, and it mainly serves adults uh, who either have Medicaid insurance or who are uninsured. So this is what an ordinary clinic looks like these days. It's got stacks of charts, paper charts, and lines of people waiting for care. And even though people think of San Mateo County as uh, kind of a rich, white, suburban county, the people we serve do not fit that, uh, that, that demographic at all. The people we serve, as I mentioned, they're low income, they're uninsured, uh, and they're incredibly diverse. So the patients I take care of, for example, I would say about 40% of them are from somewhere in Latin America, about 25% of them are Caucasian, and the rest of them come from all over the world, all over the world. I take care of folks who live in China, Romania, Russia, um, uh, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, I mean literally all over the world. Um, we fortunately have an incredible translation system, which is the topic of yet another lecture that we use to be able to really communicate with those folks. And the staff in this clinic, they really needed something different. And um, so they worked on it, they worked on something different in this clinic. One of the things that we're really big on in San Mateo uh, is we join collaboratives. And collaboratives are groups, usually groups of folks, who, have, who want to work on a certain type of thing in care, and they come from uh, all over the state or all over a local area. So in 2004, this, the staff in this clinic, led by one provider, one primary care provider, joined a diabetes collaborative. Uh, this was 2004, and the collaborative was intended to improve care for diabetics. Uh, by using a registry, which allows you to manage a population of people, and focusing on outcomes. Uh, the Coleman redesign was intended to reduce our cycle times in the clinic and to try to have more team-based care. Uh, Rand McCall was a collaborative, was actually a research project that helped looked at ways, different ways of doing chronic care uh, spread. Optimizing primary care was about advanced access, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we have a retinal screening camera, and we have an e-prescribing program. So all of these different collaboratives focused on different ways of innovating primary care. And just to take a step back about primary care and the, and the history of medicine in this country. The history of medicine in this country is all about acute care, okay? The doctor's visit is about the 15 or 10 or 5 minute encounter where somebody comes in, they've got a problem, they've got a sore throat, they've got chest pain, they've got stomach pain, they've got a cut on their finger. It's all about dealing with that person, with that problem in front of you in that moment. And as we saw before, what's killing people in this country? It's behavior and it's behavior that leads, it's bad behavior that leads to chronic diseases. And chronic disease care is not dealt well with in this acute care encounter. And so that's one of the problems with medicine today is that we've got a system that's about acute care, but the people who are coming in have chronic illness. And so all of these collaboratives are about changing the way we provide primary care to have the system of care we use match the problems that people have that are coming in to see us. And it's not easy. So this is uh, a happy group of providers and staff in the clinic. Uh, the older gentleman there is Ed Wagner, um, and many of you may have heard his name. He's actually the father of the model of chronic disease management. And so out of all of this collaborative work and other things that, uh, and experience we've had um, and help from a lot of outside organizations like the California Healthcare Foundation and Kaiser, we came up with a model for this clinic uh, that took all of these innovations and put them in one place. And so it involves team-based care. So, you know, I'm a doctor. I, I can't do the same kind of work that a diabetes nurse educator can do. I can't do the kind of work that a social worker can do. And so a lot of times the problems that my patients come to me with, especially in the safety net setting, are things that I'm really not well trained to do, but a lot of times I'm expected to do. So team-based care is using uh, the skills of a diverse group of people to address the needs of the patient. So for example, in the senior care center where I work, I work with uh, other doctors, of course, two nurse practitioners, a psychologist, a licensed clinical social worker, 
uh, a number of nurses uh, and registration staff to really address, and occupational therapists to address the needs of the patients that we serve. We do case management, there's case management telephone outreach, so moving away from that 15 minute visit to <coughs> visits to encounters that really are more convenient for people. So calling people by the phone, going to their homes. Um, flexible expanded staff roles to try to use everybody's skills well. Chronic disease management, was, which is the topic of yet another lecture, which is about really marrying our system to the problems that people come to us with. Uh, managing folks, people's medication. Uh, advanced access. Now advanced access is a topic that I'm very passionate about. So um, how many people in this room wait, have to wait more than a month to see their doctor? So a lot. When you get, if, if, if you were uh, using safety net services, it would probably go up. And, and depending on the type of doctor, you know, an orthopedic surgeon, you might have to wait three months. Um, so it's different, different doctors. But these waits create huge inefficiencies in care, right? If you, could ha if you had a problem today and you went and saw your doctor today, that um, does away with uh, missed visits, lots of phone calls. Uh, problems with medical records. So advanced access is about the, having the, the demand for the day and the supply for the day be matched. This is a really important way of getting inefficiencies out of our system. Focusing on outcomes is another really important thing. Um, if, if, if I'm managing a population of diabetics, I want to be really sure that the people whose sugars are uncontrolled are the people who come into my office or the people who see my nurse or are called by my nurse. <coughs> And so having uh, electronic medical records and other ways that we have of managing populations of people as opposed uh, in, a, in a more proactive way, rather than having people come to the clinic with their problems of that day, this is a really important thing as well. Um, EMRs, registries help us do those things. So this model is really what I would say, these are all the elements of what we need in our future system of care, ambulatory care, to take care of people with chronic diseases. This is just an example of a team. Actually, um, the doctor who on the right there, Dr. Shukla, is the one who took many of these photographs, so I want to give her full credit for that. Um, we actually changed the, uh, the, the geography of the clinic to try to promote teams working together. So instead of doctors and nurses, everybody going off into their little office, we actually co-located the teams together to make sure that they would communicate with one another in the provision of care uh, to our patients. <laughs> we changed the phone system, so instead of our patients going to just a central phone line and getting lost in the shuffle, we actually had uh, the patients go directly into their pods, so they were directly connected with that, the, those teams. Now, if you're a doctor, you're gonna laugh really hard at this slide, but it's just to demonstrate that what we really want to do with these teams is to serve the needs of the patients better and to have better communication. And, and one of the things that we do in these clinics, this was a result of a previous collaborative, we use walkie-talkies so that people don't have to be screaming at each other or walking around the clinic. It, it reduces you know, waste and inefficiency in the system. This is our retinal camera. Um, this is a way of screening diabetics who might have retinal disease. Um, this is a medical assistant. She takes the picture, and the picture is then read by uh, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist who can decide whether or not the patient needs uh, to see a, a, an eye specialist right away. We talked about advanced access, doing today's work today instead of letting it wait uh, for a week or more down the road. And um, this is our, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that we're implementing an electronic medical record. And that has been, we're in our second week now in this clinic. It's going really well. It, uh, yet another lecture is about uh, electronic medical records and the benefits and the difficulties there are in implementing those. But I, I firmly believe that we all are going to need to be on electronic medical records. I, I, I actually think that if we had chips that we could implant under the skin <laughs> with our medical records, that would be the perfect way to go. You know, they, they do it for dogs, but not yes, for people. Maybe they could do it with um, jewelry. Yes, exactly, exactly. No, there's actually a guy who did that 20 years ago. It was just announced on one of the healthcare blogs that I read that, I read, that he realizes that it, was, it, uh, it never went anywhere, so he's abandoning it. Well, it's, it's going to come back. Oh. That's my prediction. Um, but there's, it's not, um, 
there's a reason that the federal stimulus package contains a lot of money for uh, health information technology because you know the, the the policy wonks all understand how important this is. It, having electronic medical records, it uh, it it's it's much more efficient. It reduces medical errors. There are a lot of different reasons why it's it's important, but it also uh, it's difficult to do. So we this is uh, our clinic manager Rob Fleming, and this is the new name of our clinic, the Innovative Care Clinic. The sign is up now. It's not just on the floor with Rob looking cute. Um, and it's actually working for our patients. So this was one of the, the quotes. We, we, we definitely uh, involve patients in the care that they're receiving, and we ask them a lot about how things are going. And this is one of the quotes from uh, a patient who um, was, was part of the Innovative Care Clinic. So uh, just to talk about lessons. It's really important when you're doing these kinds of things to have a vision and not be distracted. Um, this clinic and the staff in the clinic, and actually staff in many of our other clinics, um, understand that this is the model we want. And even though we're cutting the budget, or we have an epidemic of swine flu, or whatever else is going on that can distract us, it's really important to stay tied to that vision. And it's really most important for those of us who are leaders not to get distracted and to continue to remind our staff why we're here. We're here for the patients, and we want to do things as effectively and as, as efficiently as we can. Um, one of the things I'm really, really proud of in our medical center is that we're very, very good with succession planning and leadership development, particularly for doctors. Um, and it's those folks who are going to be the people who do these things. So that doctor that I that I showed you, Dr. Shukla, she is an absolute star. And she's the one who's driven a lot of these changes. We have other doctors, we have other staff. Rob Fleming um, was a good, great partner for her. These folks drive change. And it's important to get them, to mentor them, to coddle them, and to help them lead change for the rest of it. Because I can't do it on my own. Um, Involving experts from the field is also important. So that Ed Wagner, um, he is you know, the father of the chronic disease model. We've, we've invited him in. We've invited Eric Coleman, who's big on care transitions between hospital and ambulatory. We invite all these experts in because they are valuable to help us in our quest. Um, we take advantage of every opportunity to innovate. Um, we, uh, in San Mateo, I think we're very unique in the way we collaborate with others. So for example, we're in the, in the midst of an effort uh, that we call the uh, Community Health Network for the Underserved. And we have involved every single provider in our community, okay? The Health, San, health Plan of San Mateo, which is a county organized health uh, plan, so they uh, cover folks who have Medicaid and Medicaid and Medicare. Every private hospital, every big health plan, so Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, We've got Palo Alto Medical Foundation. All of those groups we are in regular communication with, and we have gotten every single one of those providers in our community to step up and help us take care of the underserved. And that's another, that's another conversation, but it's worked really well. And it's been important as we move uh, on this quest to innovate. Making mistakes is part of it. You can't innovate and not make mistakes. And it's important to recognize the mistakes learn from them and move on. A lot of people are afraid of making mistakes, but it is, uh, it's gonna happen. And we use a concept that's really um, common in this. It's plan, do, study, act. So we have very quick cycles of testing change, and that's all about testing ideas. Uh, they work or they don't, and then you move on and you try the next idea. We uh, celebrate our wins. Actually, we're in the midst right now. Is today, what is today? Today is a we're um, in the middle of Nurses Week, and uh, next week is Hospital Week, and we take advantage of these um, of these types of things to really celebrate our employees and to recognize what they do for us every day. Um, just a small vignette: we wanted to really recognize individuals who stood out in our organization. We have about 1,200 employees at the medical center, and we said to our staff, "Help us recognize people who do well." And so we thought, you know, we'd get maybe 30 or 50 people. We got our staff to recognize 120 nurses and 140 other staff. So we have, we have an engaged group of folks who's, who's really about celebrating wins. 
And measuring success, that's, that's the other thing that's really important. And I don't, I don't have a lot of statistics and numbers for you here, but we track what we do. So for example, with diabetics and these collaboratives, uh, we look at what, what are people's hemoglobin A1Cs? That's the way of measuring somebody's sugar over a longer term period. What are their LDL cholesterols? What is their blood pressure? We measure these things, we watch, we watch them, and we publicize that information for the organization. So we can see who's doing well, who's not, why. And I can tell you from experience, the minute you take your eye off of those numbers, those, those objectives, they suffer. You have to watch what you're doing in order to get there. And I think that is the end of my talk. And how, I don't know uh, if we're taking questions now or? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, Frank, you're going to open it up. But yeah, okay. but, um, so. but I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Again, I'll introduce myself, introduce uh, the program I work on for New America back in Washington, D.C., and then um, I might take a second to discuss, because it's come up in some of the side conversations we've had, um, my experience around the health care reform in Massachusetts only to um, highlight what I think drives uh, reform and then go uh, into our moderation. So my name is Frank Mitch Kay. I'm the managing director of the Next Social Contract Initiative at New America. Uh, in Washington, D.C. And as Leif mentioned, uh, what the Next Social Contract Initiative is trying to do is to look at uh, how the institutions and policies that were put in place, uh, primarily starting with the New Deal, but post-war as well, that really worked as far as um, creating a mobile, uh, uh, thriving middle class for the most part, um, and how those institutions and policies have failed to keep up with the changes in society and with the changes, just uh, technology, uh, changes in the globalized economy. And I think healthcare is perhaps the single greatest example of a system that was established um, in piecemeal, as, as Leif indicated, but um, that was established and worked pretty well um, for the world of the 1950s when uh, care was certainly less advanced, care was less expensive, uh, care was less uh, sought after, I guess, and, and those all sort of feed into each other. Um, and people were working um, in, as Sarah's uh, slide went out, in one of those little red boxes or houses uh, where they were uh, working for a long time for the same employer. All that obviously is, is sort of out the window. Um, so the question is, how? what's next? How do you adapt those institutions to the changes that have happened in the world and, and with technology? And that's, where Next Social Contract is studying. We've done a great deal of work um, on the federal level with the healthcare reform, partnering with the health policy program in New America there. Um, and uh, our folks in the health policy program are, are on a daily basis working with the different committees um, that Mike had described to, uh, to talk about our ideas on um, what we feel uh, is necessary for healthcare reform. Uh, probably the biggest and what's become sort of a consensus, it seems, is um, both universality and then also um, mandatory uh, coverage, or mandatory coverage in the sense that every individual would be required to, uh, to get coverage. Now you can't do that uh, if, to be reasonable and to be fair if you're not going to uh, change the current system because forcing, and, and President Obama and, and uh, now Secretary of State Clinton got into this about Forcing folks into a dysfunctional system uh, is not anyone's idea of good reform or positive reform. Uh, so that allows me to talk very briefly about what happened in Massachusetts. Uh, the the uh, system in Massachusetts, for Massachusetts started off with a very um, comparatively functional healthcare system. I think we were at 7% uh, um, uninsured, which is very low. We were up, up in that area with Hawaii and um, Minnesota, so among the best states as far as having folks with insurance. Um, but for those who didn't have insurance, the system was a nightmare. The, um, the uh, small group insurance market was um, not very good. The individual market was horrible. And again, if all that had been done was the creation of this individual mandate, which drove a lot of the changes in Massachusetts, uh, we would have been forcing people who 
had either made an econo a rational economic decision not to get coverage because it was cheaper to pay out of pocket on the very small chance that they'd actually um, be, uh, have an incident, uh, or we'd be forcing people who just didn't have the money to somehow find that money and um, get into this very dysfunctional individual or small group market. So there were, so uh, the Romney administration uh, brought in the hospitals, the insurers, uh, all of the stakeholders, advocates for uh, those who uh, didn't have insurance, those advocates for those who uh, believe in a single payer system, and brought them together. And they may, and everyone gave a little bit. Uh, the hospitals were willing to experiment with um, repayment methods and with uh, shuffling of the Medicaid money, which they had previously considered sort of their own, um, and, and didn't want to give any uh, turf up uh, around that money. Uh, the insurers came to the table and said, if you create a mandatory system, uh, that opens up a lot of uh, new uh, appealing potential clients for us, potential uh, insurees. So we're willing to work with you on some of the other things that are not so appealing to us, uh, including some of the uh, rating issues and, and other things. Uh, and then uh, the, the policymakers, all of them were coming at this from a, a different angle, uh, came together around the idea of universality. And, and so Governor Romney and Senator Kennedy, who had run against each other for Senate uh, 10 years before uh, in a pretty acrimonious fight, came together and worked together extremely well um, with the shared goal of universal, universality, but with different uh, perspectives on how to get there. So all I, I would say uh, with regard to California and the nation is that that model worked. Uh, and it worked for a number of reasons. But if we can uh, find those sorts of uh, dynamics uh, in the federal or even at the state level here in California, um, I think that's going to improve the chances for reform uh, a great deal. So uh, having said all that, um, I will turn to uh, moderating the discussion of, of the folks who have already presented here. And I, I'd make a note in leading into a first question, and it's that um, much of what Susan described as far as what's been successful in their innovations fit perfectly with what Sarah described as far as the civil society hubs. Um, you've taken that concept of sharing uh, information, sharing interests, sharing uh, you know, the ability to leverage, uh, whether it's uh, expertise or probably resources as well, and applied it to uh, the world of, of healthcare, of, of medical care delivery, in a way that I think fits very well with that's probably not a coincidence, although I'm sure you didn't collaborate on that. But, uh, uh, but it's very interesting, and it's probably something that uh, Sarah will take home and, and um, tout, and, and uh, I think it's, it's uh, good to know. So I guess I'll, I'll start off with questions, but I intend this to be uh, primarily driven by your questions, and you've heard a great deal about um, some very interesting innovations. But um, sticking with the medical theme, uh, idea of first do no harm. You're both leading very innovative, uh, Susan and Sarah, leading innovative uh, programs that have taken a uh, non-system, as Lee described it, and tried to make it work better for your specific clientele. So in looking at the reforms that are going on, either at the state level or at the national level, what's your I guess I'll couch it this way. What's your nightmare scenario? What do you not want to see them do that could could really hurt um, your the innovations that you and others are uh, are taking in? Or, or to put it another way, um, what should they do to allow those to continue and to allow others to innovate in different ways? Um, I actually really don't have a really good question because I think that there's one thing if I could have like a, a magic wish it would be that there would uh, be room for innovation that my sense is that there's a lot on the agenda understandably uh, of policymakers based a lot on their experiences of what they want to get done um, or have wanted to get done particularly in the last eight years and so what I would really like is that each each thing that they do, they leave a window of wiggle room open for innovation, such that it wouldn't be, for instance, 
there will be an exchange. There will be a place for large employers, small employers, individuals, period. But that it would say, subject to whomever's discretion, you know, the head of HHS or God knows who, that you could apply to innovate and it would kind of like violate some of these rules, but so long as, as you could do that, that would be huge. So I, I can think of a couple things. One is that uh, one of the things that makes this kind of innovation dif difficult is that um, it really, using a team and using skills of a diverse team, uh, trying to reach people in their homes and through things that aren't visits is very, very difficult with the system of reimbursement we have now. Because we are paid based on encounters. We're paid uh, not just in the ambulatory setting, but also uh, in-house. In so, for example, um, we get paid when I see a patient, but if a nurse sees a patient to do a diabetic teaching session, we don't get paid for what she does. Um, we get paid if we, and this is vagaries of our own system, but we'll get paid if somebody sees a licensed clinical social worker, but if they see a marriage and family counselor, we don't get paid. So having those kinds of very strict restrictions on the way we get paid, and you know, God forbid if, if they get more restrictive, that, that would really impede our ability to do this kind of innovation. And then uh, a corollary to that is that if we are to get uh, some type of capitated rate or some kind of rate that is uh, much more flexible for us, the thing that I fear the most is that then that rate is slashed. And it's particularly difficult for safety net providers because we always do more with less. Um, you know, we, we, you know, Medicaid, especially in California, is, you know, pays the smallest percentage of costs, I think, in the nation. And so, um, and I know that that is, it, it conflicts with what I said about, you know, spending $8,000 per person per year, but I think there are, there are pockets of disparities, and so for safety net providers, you know, to, to give us the flexibility is great, but we need to be able to maintain the funding that we have, um, given that we're mostly relying on Medicaid, thanks that very Can I just say, you know, I, sort of an observation that I think is a bit of a duh, but is ne nevertheless the truth, which is you just always have to follow the money, right? And so if we are able to be our own insurance company and then we can start looking at some of the coding so long as it fits within, you know, whatever the mandates are, that the insurance company could have a lot of flexibility. But we don't set up the incentives for traditional insurance companies to do that. But one of the things that we're looking at is uh, two things. One is, which we were just discussing, we're trying to create a network of um, nurse practitioners as primary care physicians rather than doctors because, again, following the money, the doctors, I'm making up these numbers, but the doctors bill out at, let's say, $300 an hour, and the nurse practitioners, I think largely because they're women, but anyway, make, let's say, $150 an hour. But the patient, our member, pays $300 and then the 150 goes to the facility. So what we want to do is to sort of do nonprofit arbitrage in a good way and to get it so that we're just paying the nurse practitioner a little bit more money but uh, less than the doctor's network and then they have a completely different way of practicing medicine. We're also trying to do that with mental health care providers. So a lot of our members who are freelancers are therapists and they have the same thing, $150 an hour, they bill that rate, it goes to the insurance company, they get back $75. Well, we would like to then have our members be able to go for $75. Well, who are our freelancers? They're the people, many of whom you know, are working in their jammies at 10 o'clock. So they can go to see the therapists at the time that other people can. And using technology, you can start doing these, these kinds of matches, which starts making it that you could imagine ways of making things more affordable rather than compromising care. But you can only do it if you control the money, which then sort of goes to the whole point of like, how could there be openness in the system to watch it, see how people are innovating, however you said it. Act, do, think, plan, plan do, do, study, study yeah. PDSA. Great. Uh, Leif reminded you have worst case scenarios, nightmares of either state or federal uh, reforms that could, could harm, do more harm than good. I'd actually like to mention that the following outcomes there is the, the best case scenario, and, and what you said about um, 
innovation, I think, really rings true. I, American, when Americans actually make policy, they're far more prescriptive about every you know, regulation that has to be followed all the way down the line, with the perverse consequences sometimes that the things don't get implemented as well as they should. There has to be some flexibility, there has to be experimentation, perhaps at the state level. I remember um, a few years back, I was talking to a high-ranking official in the Israeli healthcare system, where they actually have a pretty good healthcare system, and he was, I was trying to explain how Medicare worked in the U.S., and I was getting bogged down, and he said, you know, we have a saying in Israel, and especially in healthcare, let life take its way. And that's what you Americans don't do. You're always trying to prescribe every detail, and you actually have to have some trust that you're going to work things out as it goes along. And so I guess that's the reverse of a nightmare scenario, but I think, and this actually is relevant um, to Massachusetts, because the Massachusetts experiment is still going on. I mean, it's not a settled experiment, but they actually started with getting universal coverage. They made a lot of decisions that were good politically, and they're working out the details quite effectively, I would argue, some disagree, as they go along. So that's what I'd like to see happen in universal coverage and comprehensive reform at the national level. And what my fear is that we actually get bogged down in that useless counterproductive minutia that hinders a lot of the programs we have at the moment. Yeah, I'll just say very quickly, because I'm looking forward to hearing from the audience, and I really appreciate everybody's patience sticking around um, and, and for coming out, that you know we have this whole raft of reforms and that we're just going to get the easiest ones. And that uh, so many of these health reforms actually depend on each other. Like I said, you have to have the incentives pointing in the same direction for all the different providers. And if we get just sort of the lowest hanging fruit, we can actually make the system worse than we have it right now by making it more complex more uh, and uh, without really solving the central problems. All right. Well, why don't we open the floor to questions, sir? So, what yeah, is please, the highest? Please identify yourself. Oh, uh, I'm Don Lipper. I'm a uh, ghost writer, freelance ghost writer. Okay. Okay. Sarah would like to see you afterwards. Who is signing you up? Yeah. All right. Um, so, what is the high hanging fruit? If uh, I give you a magic wand and you can have one piece uh, in your legislative agenda go absolutely sailing through Congress and it will pass, but only one, what would that high hanging fruit be to make the biggest change fastest? Um, I don't know about fastest, but then it's already happening to some extent more than it ever has with the stimulus package, but um, putting in place an independent comparative effectiveness agency that compares um, with good studies and with the best known evidence the value of different medical <coughs> procedures and treatments. We've got a 1.1 billion in the stimulus package, which doesn't sound like much, but is infinitely more than it's ever been before. Every other country does this. Basically, in the US, we don't have a strong evidence base for what we do in medicine. And there's, you know, doctors really often don't know or, you know, or don't have easy access to what works best and often for the lowest cost. And worse, they yeah. are encouraged by the manufacturers of those devices or the makers of those drug companies to, to go ahead and do it without any uh, evidence. And, and just to tag on to that, when, when we look at that $8,000 per person, the reason that it's not because we're older than we used to be or anything like that. The reason we have that is because we do more to, pe to every individual than is done anywhere else. And oftentimes the things that we do at the end of life, at the very beginning of life, are not contributing to either uh, better outcomes or better quality or even what people would want for themselves. So this is, uh, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I, so, I completely agree. And it's a very interesting part of the debate around healthcare reform that I think is, um, not as broadly discussed as maybe it could be. But the, I'll make the counterpoint just because I've seen it um, in, re in reading on this issue. The counterpoint is, I don't want some bureaucrat in Washington reading a study or a series of studies and telling my doctor what they can and can't give me, or telling me what I can't get from my doctor the way of service. How would you counter that? Well, I guess what I would say is, um, would you rather have somebody uh, or a group of people looking at the best evidence related to, say for example, a stent that you put in your coronary arteries, 
Or would you rather have an individual doctor who's relying on information only from the manufacturer who makes that stent about what goes in? What would you prefer? I mean, I think that's a, it's, it's pretty obvious what, what makes more sense. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm interested in focusing on the primary care issue. So this is for Susan, and I guess Massachusetts maybe want to weigh in. There's been an increasing number. Of, oh, I don't. Know. Pretty loud music. You're, you're, you're quieter now. Okay. Uh, there's an increasing number. There've been an increasing number of articles about the shortage of primary care physicians and what a universal coverage or universal mandate would, uh, the type of demand, as you talked about, supply versus demand man would create and and how it relates to how the system needs to focus more on chronic care and less on acute care and all, there's been a, a lot that, um, there's been a lot about all of these different issues um, and so now because of the reimbursement system um, and doctors desires to uh, pay for expensive medical education the medical education system or non-system is producing more specialists and primary care doctors. So how are we going to meet the needs of the primary care innovation that you described, Susan, if we have an insufficient number of primary care doctors? And do you think we are going to have an insufficient well, thank, number? Well, thank you so much for mentioning that because as a primary care internist, this is an issue very near and dear to my heart. And things have changed. I completed my residency in Boston in 2002, and even since then, things have changed dramatically. So there was just a study uh, published in the, in the peer-reviewed journals about the percent of, uh, of medical students who are choosing to go into primary care. It's about two to three percent, okay? And there's no way we're gonna be able to do this, all these changes and this focus on ambulatory care. We're never gonna do it unless we can get, uh, unless we can change that. What happens now is that a lot of the folks who are doing primary care are nurse practitioners or physician's assistants or foreign medical graduates. And I don't have anything against foreign medical graduates. There are a lot of them who do really well, but we're seeing fewer and fewer people in, uh, in the United, who, go, who go through medical school in the United States choosing primary care as a career. Now, why is that? Let me give you a very specific example. I do, uh, as, as part of my job, I focus a lot on what different types of doctors make um, because we contract with doctors for services. So here's a specific example. If you look at, there's a, there's a company that compares salaries for physicians uh, um, of different types in different places in different ways, big book called MGMA. The, um, if you look just in the Western region, because that's what I'm, you know, I'm familiar with, if you look at the salary for a primary care internist, the median salary for a primary care internist in the Western region, it's somewhere around, let's say, 150,000, okay? What do you think the median salary is for a neurosurgeon? 650,000, okay? So that's a pretty dramatic disparity, but I can tell you in every, med in every subspecialty you look at, you're gonna see that range. That's the most dramatic, but it's pretty dramatic. And the work that primary care doctors do is hard, and so, when I was coming out of medical school, there were still a lot of people who wanted to do primary care medicine, and that that amount has gone down, 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 down. And you can look at, you know, well, is this, you know, is this a difference in the in the people? You know, is there a difference in values? There are a lot of arguments about that. You know, the baby boomers versus the the Gen Xers and the millennials. Is there a difference? Maybe. You know, it's not it's not compelling that there is. It's really, you know. People are making economic decisions about their life. How much money am I going to be? Am, you know, the debt that I'm coming out of from medical school can be as high as two hundred thousand dollars. Can I afford to pay my debt and you know live in a house and raise a family with this money? So, so what do you? You ask the question. <laughs> I'm going on and on, but I think part of the healthcare reform really needs to take a very clear look at payments for doctors. Um, it needs to look at incentives for doctors to go into various specialties. What about control over medical education? There seems to be virtually none. Oh, no, there's control. And there are ways that um, different providers can be incentivized, say through you know loans or, or, or payment of loans, the National Health Service Board, 
you know, different states have different loan payment um, programs for folks who choose to go into the into the primary care. I was specialties. thinking about limiting the residencies uh, for specialists where sure. we have. So, but the thing is, that <coughs> control is itself control, right? When you've got a whole bunch of people making six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, what they say ends up being pretty important. And so what happens is that a lot of times you set up these government programs, um, such as the, the, Medica the initial Medicare uh, fees uh, that were paid out weren't as disparate as they are uh, today. But over the course of 20 years, they started benefiting specialists more and more. And why? Because, what was, who said follow the money earlier? Yeah. Follow the money, right? So what, one thing I'm a little bit concerned about is if what we try to do uh, to respond to this is try to bring primary care physicians up to the level of specialists or try to offer these massive loan repayment programs so that primary care physicians uh, will, uh, or physicians who operate in medical and un underserved areas will be able to uh, have a good life because that's a, that's, a, that's a massively expensive proposition. Where I'd like to see it is that we reimburse uh, uh, accountable care systems so they can be hospitals and so on and so forth for the quality of the outcomes that they produce, which is to say, for keeping people healthy. And then, the primary care doctors will naturally do uh, uh, well, because they're the folks who are uh, best at managing these behavioral issues and so on. Uh, but I do worry so about- you're advocating reimbursing systems, well, organized health systems versus I, individual providers. I, I guess what I would say is that uh, I, I worry about health reform that equals uh, more money for everybody, right? Um, because that, I mean, with apologies to Massachusetts, that's you know how they got it done there. And now they're looking at, well, now that everybody's in the system, we've got uh, some sticks we can use to bring people into line, right? But we can't really do that on the federal level. And unfortunately, a lot of the recommendations that came out of finance are, well, let's bump up primary care physicians you know, some really nominal amount, uh, and that's not gonna get it done because people didn't get into med school by not knowing how to do math, right? right? <laughs> They're extraordinarily smart people. And so bumping primary care physicians up 5% or 10% so that now they're only compensated, you know, 150% less than specialists, I just I just don't think it's gonna get us where, where, we, where we need to be. I, I think also we just have to realize that what care is going to be delivered in all so very many different ways and places and by different practitioners and you know if the market if somebody else can do the same job at like what amount um, somebody else if the nurse practitioner can do the same job as a doctor and have the same kind of outcomes if not better then why are we paying that and I just think we have to think about that as well well you all have been extremely patient we're about five before one and I think Probably want to wrap up. Uh, yeah, I think maybe take the last two questions. Yeah, so um, we've got a so question in the back, and then maybe we can yeah, come up the front. Of this. I actually had two questions. Can I take uh, them too? Uh, very quickly. So the first one was um, Is there a system out there where doctors or health care facilities get paid to keep people healthy as opposed to fixing them once they're sick? And if there is, where is that? Um, and then also, in the first slide that Susan had on health care costs in the United States, I'm just curious what all that includes. Is it Medicaid, Medi Cal, Medicare? Employer and employee premiums and co pays. It's all expenditures. So it's everything. Okay. And how about a system that works? Not, not to, um, you know, not to be too parochial here. The, the, but the Kaiser in California is an example of an integrated system that probably the incentives work the best to do this. The doctors are salaried, and um, it's an integrated system, a combination of insurer and you know the delivery system. So. The incentives, look, the original, everyone nowadays hates HMOs, but the original idea behind HMOs, it was, dare I say, a left-wing concept, you know, that you would give a fixed amount of money per person, everybody would get into the system, and then the incentives would be to keep people healthy so you wouldn't pay more with each visit. But what happened, of course, is that, you know, mainly private business got into the game. These started off as not-for-profits, and they figured out, at least for a while, that you could make money by signing up people who are basically healthy, they wouldn't go to the doctor, but they'd still get the same capitated payment. So that much reviled managed care system actually is in its you know, original kernel of an idea, exactly that sort of model that you're talking about. But, but Kaiser, which is an integrated system and a managed care organization, 
probably does that the best. And it's a very long story that we can talk about for a long time about why the Kaiser model has remained largely isolated geographically in the West, although it's spread a bit more. And it hasn't you know, taken, taken the country by storm. It has a lot to do with physician practice styles and, uh, and other things in different parts of the country. But so there is that here, the VA system. Um, my colleague and Frank's colleague, Phil Longwood, has written a, a book about this, some um, excellent book about you know, how the VA system has integrated medical records. It's not perfect by any means in every way, but the main distinctive feature of the VA system is they know they're going to have their patients for a long time. So it makes sense for them to in, you know, do the kind of system building, electronic medical records, keeping track of the patients, that pays off in the long run. And that most people who are just shuttling in and out of different insurers, that there isn't an incentive for insurers or anybody else to do that sort of long run um, vision. So I hope that's. Uh, Sarah, has, have you, as a now an insurance company, been able to get at any of this, or is, is are you? Yeah, I, I feel like this has been incredibly interesting. And, and yes, I mean, I just have one small anecdote. I mean, we only had our first quarter, so it's not like um, that's a lot of time. But um, there's one example that I just think is so interesting that um, women, after they give birth, if there's a nurse practitioner or a provider who comes to their house, uh, that they can pick up pretty quickly if there's like a postpartum depression or a problem with the kid, and it's incredibly cost effective. And so that's something that we can do right away because we're the insurer and it is really cost effective. But I think a lot of these other things are more complicated and over time, like we really do have to figure out. And I feel like what I've been really trying to do is start up with my own matrix of like, what are the top 20 things that people are having issues with and trying to figure out like, what are the top three that we can do something about? And right away, it's again on a longer term proposition. So. Yeah, I mean, I just think if you set up the incentives exactly for that, we have to keep people healthy for many, many years because we want to be in business for that long. I, I just say, if I were doing another topic after this, I would do the entrance of private equity capital into healthcare and after 1980 and the demutualization of the insurance industries that used to provide the healthcare. And that, I think, like tells a lot of the story. All right, our final question, please. Uh, in 25 words or less, <laughs> Who or what are the forces that seem to be quashing on a national level, that is in D.C., the discussion of single-payer health care, and why? Sure. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I think that uh, there are a lot of people who genuinely uh, would prefer a single-payer plan. President Obama has said that. Uh, uh, he would prefer a single payer plan and he doesn't think that it can get uh, through. And so they're focusing, and, and they, they might be wrong about that. Um, and, you know, we'll, uh, and, and they're, they're not taking that risk, which I think is interesting. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a policy monk, but I'm also a political scientist. And it's, it's not totally obvious that it's more difficult to get comprehensive reform than it is to get incremental reform. Often it's actually easier to get massive reforms through the system than it is to try to put all the different cards on top of the card you know, stack and keep all the insurers happy and all the doctors happy and all the hot. We're trying to keep everybody happy. And that's actually a more difficult you know, prospect in a lot of cases than saying, all right, these people have to go. They're not adding value to the system. We're not going to try to bring them on. And we're going to totally change the way that we do things. But President Obama got elected president, and I didn't. And uh, you know he uh, seems to believe that we couldn't do the more comprehensive reform, and so uh, you know everybody has decided that uh, we're going to look at these more incremental reforms. Can I just say something about that? There was a really interesting um, essay that was written in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago by one of my favorite authors, Atul Gawande, and he looked at the evolution of um, of coverage in three different countries. I think he picked France and Britain and Germany. And all of those countries obviously have uh, universal systems of healthcare that are different. And what he did is he went back and he looked historically at the way those systems had developed. And they all developed because of unique circumstances in the country at that time. So for example, Britain's system evolved because of the way healthcare was provided during World War II. And France was different and Germany was different. And so the point he was making is that 
um, if you look at the way universal health evolves around the globe, you know, over time, you don't see some huge shift from doing it one way to doing it completely another way. You, you see each system, each country, built on what they had to get to the next step. And so I think it was really an interesting realization for me to understand that it's probably, even though single payer makes sense in a lot of, in, in most ways, it, it's a, there's no historical precedent for a country, any country, to go from you know where we are now to a single payer model. Can I just say that article is also in the same author in the New Yorker in mm -hmm. a really fun way. Mm -hmm. But can I just say this about that? I think if you say like in five years, like what is this going to look like? I think it's going to look like every other country in many ways, which is there's a basic universal plan, whatever, the floor, and then there's a supplemental. Some countries have much more of a basic plan, and some countries have much more of a supplemental plan. But where it's it's to me, it's just a question of like where is that going to be? And I often find like the discussion of single payer, like I don't even know what that means anymore. And I think that another way to look at it is just like where is the money? You know, how are we paying for this? And are we achieving these kinds of goals? You know, because it sometimes gets to be like a litmus test, like are you for it, or are you against it, <coughs> good or are you bad, and it's just like not helpful, but really it is making sure that there's a universal base amount that everybody's going to get. And I would answer that question with one word, which is Hillary Care, and people are scarred from that experience, and I think that's where, where the people you might Why think... Why don't say Clinton Care? Well, well, I, and I'm not. I don't. I didn't invent the term. That's the term that's in people's minds, and the people you might think would be advocating for um, for single payer, I think, have that very, very much on the front of their minds. Who was the author of that article? You know, Atul Gawande. Atul Gawande. He's, G -A -W -A -N -D. he's right. He's one of the most amazing medical essayists there is, and he's written books, and you can find all kinds of stuff he's written that's great. I just like to make a comment. Uh, I, and I am a single payer advocate. I go to local health care for all organization. And we are going to have our our uh, public health officer speaking at our next meeting on June 6th. But um, I, I really think that Gawande had it right, that we came out of something. And what we came out of was a rejection of, of uh, communism and socialism and a, a dedication to a free market. And I'm just hoping that now as we're watching the free